This meeting is being recorded. Greetings and welcome to the Quality Insights podcast for healthcare professionals. My name is Joe Pinto, and I'm a practice transformation specialist at Quality Insights. And along with my colleague, Lamar Brown, who will be joining me on today's podcast, we participate on a team of staff dedicated to promoting and providing education on hypertension, diabetes, and statin therapy for cholesterol control across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania through our partnership with the Pennsylvania Department of Health. We have a great topic and conversation lined up for today, focusing on the telehealth needs of Pennsylvania's elderly and or uh, homebound population, specifically addressing their uh, social determinants of health and the important role that SDOH plays in their care. So let's get started. First, I'd like to welcome my colleague, Lamar Brown, who is also a practice transformation specialist for Quality Insights, serving the Southeastern Pennsylvania region, as well as throughout Delaware. Glad to have you on the podcast with me this morning, Lamar. Good morning, everyone. And with that, I'd like to introduce our guests joining us today. Today, we have three health delivery experts from Wayne Memorial Community Health Centers affiliated with Wayne Memorial Hospital in Honesdale, Pennsylvania. They serve the rural populations in Wayne and Pike counties, as well as Northern Lackawanna counties in Northeastern Pennsylvania. Norman Asilla is the Director of Clinical Operations for Quality uh, at Wayne Memorial Community Health Centers, which is a federally qualified health center. Norma is responsible for all the planning, supervision, and coordination of performance improvement, as well as clinical and operational initiatives across all Wayne Memorial Community Health Center offices located in Wayne, Pike, and Lackawanna counties. Norma also oversees the Telehealth at Home program for Wayne Memorial Community Health Centers. We welcome you to the podcast, Norma. Thank you and good morning. Michelle Cook is a registered nurse and the Telehealth Home Nurse. Michelle started her nursing career in 2011 in North Carolina, working in geriatric care in skilled nursing facilities. Upon moving back to Pennsylvania in 2015, she began a career in home health. Michelle joined Wayne Memorial Community Health Centers in September of 2021, specifically for the Telehealth at Home program. Michelle comes with many years of experience in wound care, IV care administration of medications, knowledge of medications, and community knowledge for patient resources. Welcome to the podcast, Michelle. Thank you. And last but not least, we have Dr. James G. Cruz, who is the Chief Medical Officer of Wayne Memorial Community Health Centers, Medical Director of Wayne Memorial Hospice, and serves on Medical Executive Committee of Wayne Memorial Hospital in Honesdale. Born in Louisiana, he received his medical degree from Emory University School of Medicine in Atlanta, Georgia, and completed his family medicine internship and residency at the same Emory University School of Medicine. As a board certified family practitioner, Dr. Cruz treats patients aged three years and older, focusing on the management of chronic diseases such as hypertension, diabetes, and asthma. He also leads the response to COVID for Wayne Memorial and the local community, including a weekly radio update on COVID. Dr. Cruz has been in practice for more than 25 years, and we honor, are honored to have him uh, and his expertise that he brings to our podcast today. So welcome, Dr. Cruz. Thank you, Joe. And with that, we're going to start things off. And the first question for today's podcast is going to go to Dr. Cruz. So Dr. Cruz, uh, when did you realize that there was a need for a specialized telehealth program such as this in your area of Wayne County, Pennsylvania? And just how did the outline of the program come about? Well, so I, I've been thinking about house calls and telehealth for years. I used to do house calls in my first practice right out of residency, and I really enjoyed them. But as I got busier, I really found it just wasn't practical for my schedule to do that. And I've read things over the years about different approaches to doing house calls, you know, even doctors that do only house calls. Um, and it just always kind of kept this in the back of my mind. And then also in my experience as a hospice medical director, I've, 
I do some home visits, but I also rely a lot on our nurses evaluation of the patient. You know, their physical exam, I rely on to make my medical decisions. So during COVID, we started doing a lot of telehealth and uh, telehealth. Um, but many of our patients didn't either have the technology, the, the internet speed, the technological savvy to be able to do a video telehealth visit. So we were doing a lot of phone visits. Um, and I know on one, one particular visit, um, the, the patient's daughter was a nurse who I actually know very well and have relied on for years. And so during the visit, it came up about his shortness of breath and whether it's related to congestive heart failure or COPD. And it, the idea popped in my head. I rely on this nurse all the time to do evaluations. So I had her listen to the heart, lungs, evaluate everything, and was able to make a decision based on that. And, and at the end of that, I was thinking, why can't I do this with more patients? You know, this would be great if I could do this uh, with other telehealth patients. And um, we were in a meeting one day. It came up that we had this grant for healthcare innovation. And we we're talking about uh, ways to spend that money. And I already had the outline in my head. It was, you know, it, it was, a, oh, here's the opportunity to do something I've been thinking about for a while. And I think really is very beneficial for patients. So I pitched the idea at the meeting and it took off pretty quickly. I really now, do believe you, you that mentioned is, real uh, quick. Uh, I just wanted to follow up real quick because you had mentioned, um, you know, in your opening um, explanation here, the um, the lack of resources in terms of, uh, you know, electronic uh, capability in uh, the Wayne County region. Is this something that is prevalent that you see uh, throughout the coverage area that you're providing, uh, the inability or the, the scarcity of, um, you know, internet ability? Yes, there's a, um, a lot of folks don't have good internet or, you know, a lot of the patients who need this the most or uh, have the least access to uh, to providers, least access to office visits, the least access to technology. Whether it's that you know a lot of places internet isn't very good here. Why um, you know cellular service isn't very good in parts, and a lot of these folks also don't have the smartphones and the knowledge of how to use them to really do a high quality video visit. Right. So Dr. Cruz, uh, the social determinants of health have a major impact on people's health, well-being, and quality of life. So during the creation, planning, and outlining for this program, were social determinants of health taken in consideration? And if so, what screening tools are used for SDOH? Well, well, you know, frankly, I didn't really think, oh, social determinants of health. Uh, I thought, oh, a lot of our patients are poor, don't have good access to transportation, don't have good access to, you know, technology. So those are obviously the social determinants of health, but uh, was really focusing on, um, you know, our patient population and what they need. So yes, I guess it was social determinants of health. It wasn't until someone threw out the term that I realized, well, that's what I was thinking about when I came up with the program. Yes, and that then, was definitely um, forward thinking. And as far Go as ahead, I'm sorry. some of the social health, we, um, we do use a prepare tool to, um, to kind of identify some of the social determinants. But sometimes, I, once again, I think that's a little kind of toolish and not as much of, hey, this patient needs help. You know, and that's what really is, is the thing. This patient needs help. That is true. Mm -hmm. And a growing number of um, incentives are emerging to address uh, social determinants of health. And some of those initiatives seek to increase the focus on health in non-health sectors, while others focus on having the healthcare system address broader uh, social and environmental factors that influence health. So what are some initiatives to addressing the social determinants of health and why is addressing the role of SDOH um, so important? 
Um, this is Norma. I'll, I'll just go back a little bit, uh, just historically. It was back in 2020, uh, we started actually really using the prepare tool and we were finally able to get some data. We started tracking, you know, the outcomes from, from the tool. And that's when we identified that our, our big areas of disparity are transportation, food, um, and some housing insecurities. Um, so that's, you know, where this whole transportation piece fell uh, for the, the telehealth program. But the, in addition to that, we started with looking at the food disparities and we were able to get involved with the program with our local hospital um, who started a food voucher program, um, a, a grant funded food voucher program. So patients who have uh, uh, a few specific chronic conditions and have food disparities are able, you know, they meet these indications to get into this uh, program. So they're able to get uh, food vouchers uh, through different grocery stores that, uh, you know, that they've partnered with, as well as delivery of like dried, uh, like dry ingredients of foods, uh, you know, your cereals and things like that. Um, and they also, uh, the patients who are diabetics have the opportunity to meet with a dietitian from the hospital. So it's, it's kind of a all encompassing program. So that's, that was the first attempt at uh, using our SDOH data that we were, you know, were able to collect and, and put it towards some type of a, a, a service to start wrapping around patients. So that was our, our first approach at, at you know, addressing some of those needs of patients. Great. Uh, and Norma, while you're on, on topic, um, we're going to go back a little bit and uh, uh, follow up on Dr. Cruz's answer to the first question. And I want to ask you, when the idea was first presented uh, by Dr. Cruz uh, for this telehealth at home program, uh, did, you, did the initial plan just include or you know, involve just a pilot project that might include just a handful uh, of the, uh, you know, the locations or the sites at uh, Wayne Memorial Community Health. How did this evolve as, as it went about, um, you know, starting from the inception? Uh, Joe, originally our, our, our idea was to roll this out to, to all of our, we have nine primary care sites. Uh, you know, that was always our goal to, to do that. Uh, but we did start, we wanted to start small to make sure that, you know, if there were things we needed to tweak or fix or change that we started small. So we did pilot it only in two different offices. Um, and, you know, we did, we, we made some small changes of, you know, different type of documentation, you know, different, like I said, there's some small changes in the program. Um, and then afterwards, you, you know, we checked to see, you know, what everyone's opinion was of the program, and we were able to get some really good feedback from patients and the providers about the program. So at that point, we did roll it out to all of our nine primary primary care sites, and Great. that was probably by December. It was like probably a full two months uh, that um, you know we started off small and then finally did a, an entire rollout to the nine sites. Terrific. And can you explain to the audience uh, just how the funding uh, for this program came about and, and also how the services are being billed? Sure. Um, we were able to use our uh, ARP, the American Rescue Plan, which all, you know, all the federal FQHCs did receive that money from the federal government. Uh, so we have been able to use that funding uh, for the startup of the program. Um, to uh, purchase all of the supplies needed for um, Michelle, our nurse, um, the computer, uh, all of uh, the clinical equipment that she needed, all of the patient equipment, and, and actually to replenish that as, as we use patient equipment to replenish that. Um, so that, that is where the, uh, the funding has come from, from that grant money. Um, we build the visits out as a, a, a telehealth video visit. Um, you know, that is the only piece that you're, you're able to build out because it, is, it, it truly is a, a telehealth video visit. So that is how it's built. Okay, so you're building it out at the services as a telehealth visit. Um, is there a specific code that you're using or a modifier on the encounter and claims form? 
Actually, I, I'll answer that. I don't know the, what the code is off the top of my head, but it is built like an off, it's built like an office visit, and um, there is a modifier for telehealth, whether it's a video telehealth or phone only telehealth, and we use it with that whatever that modifier is for video telehealth. You know, okay. it, it's obviously a lot more expensive than a regular uh, video telehealth visit. I wish we could get other reimbursement, and, and I think you know maybe. To, for sustainability of the program, we need to look at you know, there's other ways to get it reimbursed. But right now, that's how we're doing. Great. Uh, and Norman, Dr. Cruz, this question is also for, for you. Um, in order for a, a specific patient to be considered for the telehealth at home program, what are the sets of criteria that they must first meet in order to be a candidate for in-home telehealth visits? Well, um, to, to be to be blunt, it really probably it's the provider asks for it, we do it basically. But but the people that we're targeting are uh, folks with kind of unstable chronic conditions, um, you know, the COPD, CHF, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, all of those sort of things, chronic wounds, um, and particularly if a patient who have patient who has that that can't come to the office very easily or a patient who has one of those chronic conditions um, who develops a change in condition. You know, part of the idea of this is maybe keeping them out of the ER. So if I've got, you know, a patient with congestive heart failure, COPD and chronic kidney disease and diabetes who doesn't have transportation, um, they call me, they're short of breath. If I have time and Michelle Cook has time, you know, sending her out doing a, a video visit may save an ER visit in that patient. And that's a cost savings for the, for the whole system. Um, the other part is that they have to have some kind of significant barrier to coming to the office. So that really goes back to those social determinants of health. Okay. And just a, a side note, just correct me if I'm wrong, the patients must also be Pennsylvania residents and be 18 years of age or older, correct? That, that's correct. Because we, because of uh, licensing, you, we can't go, because of where we're lo geographically located, we're close to the New York border. Um, there are some patients who do live in, in New York um, and we have to stay within the confines of Pennsylvania. And we, uh, we see an adult population for telehealth, uh, for, for this program, for the telehealth uh, a nurse program. Uh, we, don't, we do not see pediatric patients. Uh, absolutely. And for, for those that are uh, watching this, this podcast that are not familiar uh, with the geographic location of where um, your practices are located, um, Wayne Memorial Community Health Centers is basically located in northern, uh, the northern part of uh, Pennsylvania, northeastern corner of Wayne and Pike County. So they're in the upper Delaware River Basin. Um, so you're actually... Um, uh, some of your offices are, are basically covering a three-state uh, coverage area of, uh, of nor northwestern New Jersey, um, you know, the, uh, the, the lower Catskill area of New York State, as well as northeastern Pennsylvania. That's correct. That's right. And a referral can help doctors to significantly improve and streamline communication amongst each other. So, for example, primary care physicians, specialists, and other healthcare providers. So, uh, this is for Norma or uh, Michelle. Is a referral from a case manager or provider made for the patient? It's not really a referral process, more rather of just scheduling it. A telehealth appointment with the providers um, to get on their schedule for a telehealth video call and then they put it on my schedule or coordinate it with myself so I can go out and do the assessment prior to the provider's scheduled visit. Um, the case managers, the chronic case care managers, and the ACO case managers also send me information or recommendations, not so much as a, a referral process. Like they may talk to the patient and say, this patient could benefit from a telehealth visit. What do you think? And then I go to the provider and ask, you know, would that be okay currently? Cause they're X, Y, Z can't get out of the home or they just got discharged from the hospital and don't have the strength to come in right now. So it's not so much a referral process as it is more of just scheduling and recommendation process. 
Great. Uh, and Michelle, this is a follow up question on that. So um, can you explain and go over uh, with the audience um, some of the assessment tools that you're using out in the field when you meet patients in their home? Um, and for example, some of the, the, the durable medical equipment uh, and apparatus that you bring with you out into the field. I have a slide here that I'm going to bring up next that basically I can uh show the audience what you are bringing but can you explain this more in detail for us yep so i bring almost like a small portable provider's office visit to them i bring the pole socks i bring the blood pressure equipment i'm bringing the thermometer a stethoscope to listen to their heart and lungs if they are diabetic i can check their blood sugar for, with a glucometer if they do not have their own we do weigh them every visit, so I do bring our own scales. Um, if they, doc, if the providers order blood work or an EKG with a visit, I'm able to bring that with me as well. I'm able to check ears and clean ears um, with an otoscope, and then we have an ear flush equipment as well. Um, I'm able to do diabetic foot testing in the homes with the monofilaments. Our COPD years and our asthma patients, we are able to provide them with a um, acute nebulizer treatment should they need one and not have the equipment available. And then um, the ACO currently has provided us with a REDS vest, which measures the um, risk of congestive heart failure currently, or we like to get their baseline and then go out periodically and see what they are at. We have that currently. And then I bring the laptop um, with a mobile hotspot or an iPad tablet that accesses the internet and I can document everything in the EMR and then I save the note and the providers are able to open that note and see my assessment prior to getting on their visit or can review it with the visit and the patient at the time. Excellent. And in addition to the home assessment tools that you can, everyone can see on their screen, um, what are some of the additional nursing assessments that you might make uh, during your visit, including like home evaluation or treatment options for the patients? Well, typically we like to do a head to toe assessment. Um, and then once we get that done and out of the way um, with conversation, we can also assess their home safety, um, trip hazards, fall risk patients, fire hazards, um, cleanliness of the home, it could be a disparity for them. Are they not able to do it? Do they need assistance in the home getting things done like that? Um, food is a big uh, problem that a lot of patients don't always address in the offices. So we can check actually their refrigerators, their cabinets to see if they have a food disparity and if they're being compliant with their current prescribed diet. And then we can always do the education while we're in the home. Sometimes that doesn't always come up in the doctor's office visits. You're also able to look at their meds, right? The medication yep. reconciliations. We also compare that actually moving on to the next question. We also do medication review in the home. So I'm actually reviewing the medication bottles, what they are putting into their body versus what is on our list or what they're telling us they're taking. Um, so I always ask them, can you get me the bottles of the medications you currently are taking um, and compare it to a list because sometimes their list doesn't even match what they're putting in their mouth anymore. Great. Uh, and that's an excellent point that's going to lead to the next question. This one is for Dr. Cruz specifically. Uh, Dr. Cruz, uh, during an earlier conversation uh, that we had during the planning of today's podcast session, you had made a statement claiming that an in-home visit uh, as part of the telehealth at home program is quote, better than an office visit because the nurse is able to go into the home and assess what's happening with the patient, unquote. Can you explain what you meant by that um, and how advantageous uh, it is for the clinician to have Michelle in the field working in the home with the patients? Uh, yes, Joe, and I do feel like frequently these are better visits than, than when patients come into the office because, um, because of that, me the medication reconciliation, she actually looks at the bottles and sees what they're taking. You know, hey, was this filled four months ago and you haven't finished your blood pressure medication yet? That sort of stuff comes out that never actually comes out in a visit. Um, you know, things like the, the home situation, safety, um, you know, their socioeconomic factors, you know, if they're, they're not filling their medication or they're out of medication, you know, is it because they don't have the money for it? A lot more data, so that sort of stuff comes out during this visit. 
And also, you, you, you know, you, I know one of our diabetics uh, had a couple of boxes of ding dong sitting next to the, um, <laughs> to their TV and, and, and no real food. And, you know, they're living off of, off of junk food and, and sweets. And then, you know, right there, what the problem is with their diabetic control. So, so, so in I other really words, it's it. more or less of a uh, having a boots on the ground approach and having someone with their eyes and the ears being able to uh, report what's actually taking place and not just what the patients may be telling you when they come into the office for a visit, correct? Absolutely. And I know we talked earlier, one of the criteria is they have to be a, uh, have a transportation problem to the office. I'll admit there, there have been a couple of times that folks that really didn't have a transportation problem. I've, ha I've had Michelle go out and do one of these telehealth visits because I needed that information of what's going on in the home. Why, why are we having so much trouble controlling this patient's CHF or, or whatever it is and um, really needed that home assessment as part of the visit. Great. Thanks for that insight on, on, on that. Uh, that's a very that important part. Also Adding to that also, we can also help these patients by getting them the community resources that may be available to them that they didn't even know about, so they don't mention it during a doctor's office visit. For instance, the food disparities Dr. Cruz was talking about, they're eating ding-dongs and junk food with their diabetes, but they don't have the means to buy the food that they really need, so we can assist with getting them those resources. Excellent point. And again, that all ties in with the social determinants of health. Uh, questions that, you know, this encompasses as, as a major component of the program uh, as a whole. Um, so we're going to switch gears now a little bit, and now we're going to talk about the actual data um, that you've collected throughout the first uh, five and a half to six months of the program. Um, Norma and Dr. Cruz specifically, I'm going to bring up the, uh, the chart here, which actually shows um, exactly how well uh, the program has done. I'm just going to move my screen and over here so you can have a better view of this. Um, can you uh, take a look at what, what's on the screen and explain to uh, to the uh, to the audience exactly um, what were the stated goals from the uh, the initiation of the program uh, that you identified as the the focus areas uh, and the measures that you you know, wanted to implement and, and use as a, a measuring guide for success of the program. And do you have data, you know, we, we're showing this now that the data has been collected uh, to, to, to show exactly how much success that the program has, uh, you know, provided in the first six months. Can you explain the information and the data that was collected? Uh, absolutely. Um, first of all, let me talk about why we selected the goals that we did. Um, of course, we wanted to measure the, as the social disparities of health because that is a component of this whole program. Uh, it's one of the criteria that we, you know, we wanted to make sure we incorporated patients who had a disparity. Um, didn't have to be every patient because that's not the only criteria, but it's, it is one of the criteria for selection for, for, you know, for this program. Uh, so we wanted to make sure we had that piece included under a goal. And the other uh, goal was identified because we knew that by putting a program like this in place, uh, our hopes were that we would be able to help decrease these, you know, unplanned uh, ED visits or, uh, you know, uh, unexpected ad hospital admissions. Um, if we were able to, uh, you know, really see what was happening in the home and, and maybe like the, the example Dr. Cruz just gave um, about, you know, this, the uncontrolled CHF patient that, uh, you know, if you could get in there and change meds around, you could po potentially, uh, you know, avoid a, a, an unplanned emergency room visit. Okay, so we knew we wanted to look at a goal for that. Um, the patients that we started uh, looking at originally um, in this population, when we, when we first started looking at uh, the data. We didn't have the goals identified just yet, um, but we knew that our baseline information for emergency department and uh, you know unplanned admissions, that the patients that were in our program for six months prior to being involved in the telehealth at home, 67% of those patients had an unplanned um, admission or ED visit. 67%. 
67%. And, you know, these are sick people, you know, with chronic illnesses, unstable chronic illnesses. So, you know, it wasn't totally unexpected to see 67% of the patients being admitted. So that, you know, so we started continuing to look at, okay, you know, are all of the patients, you know, in, in this group, uh, you know, six months prior having these kind of admissions? And they were. Um, and then at the same time, we started collecting the number of patients who had uh, some disparity present. Again, so then that's when we identified, yes, these really are the goals that we, we want to look at to be able to show the effectiveness of the program. Um, we, we knew that somewhere between three and 10% of our population of patients have some type of social disparity based on our prepare tool. Um, some of the disparities are only two or 3%, uh, other ones are nine to 10%, uh, depending on the population of patients. And that's where we identified, well, since we have one of the elements of criteria inclusion being a, a disparity, um, and we know that uh, somewhere around 10% of our patients do have disparities uh, that we wanted to make sure that at least greater than 15% of our patients with disparities are included in this program. Yeah, we wanna make sure we're serving at least th that many people, uh, you know, that, that many uh, patients in this population. So when we started uh, looking at month after month of data, um, you could see what the numbers look like. We, in the first uh, month of, uh, that we started the program in October, we were at 44% uh, of the patients did have disparities. And you could see month after month, it's the, the, actually the lowest month was March so far, that was 26%, but it's far over our, our goal. We wanna make sure that we're, we're, you know, we have that inclusion of patients uh, with disparities. Um, and the other piece with the, with the uh, uh, admissions, uh, the unplanned admissions and ED visits, um, we were able to decrease that those uh, visits from 67% uh, to 35%. We picked under 35%. We picked that goal of under 35%. Uh, we figured at least let's try to get that in half of what that original um, admission rate was. So, you know, that's why we chose the 35% range. But as you can see, um, that number is always consistently under the 35%. So we, we think it, it's, it's working the way we have it set up. Um, that's, you know, that's Fantastic. pretty much the whole premise for the goals and the, and the background history of it. And, at, and looking at the data that you've collected so far, it's obvious that you're exceeding the initial goals that you, you set forth and, and doing so by a wide margin. So uh, I'm, I'm sure that you're very pleased with the outcome so far in the first six months of the program. Uh, but as a follow-up question to that, what are some of the barriers that you've identified uh, throughout the first six months of the program that still must, must be overcome? Most of the time it's uh, technology, it's poor communication of just, we have very poor cell service in most of these areas. We're very rural in some of these areas. Um, majority of the population is elderly, so they don't have internet access even in their homes. They don't own a computer or any technology that needs the internet. So when we're getting out into these very rural areas, um, cell service drops and then these patients don't even have the internet. So that has been the biggest um, concern so far going through these last six months. We're trying to work through those with different providers of cellular service. Great. Um, and then Norma, and then the, this is a question for you. Um, how do you collaborate? Uh, what is the process that you use to collaborate with community health workers? Uh, actually, I'll defer that to Michelle. She could speak to that. So we have been, um, when we identify issues with patients, we have been making referrals to the ACO, Geisinger ACO case manager, and then also helping them with the um, community health worker that will be starting with us. Um, actually, they started this week, the gentleman did um, when needed. So if we identify that they are in need of a community resource, we do make that referral to the CHA or the ACO um, case managers. 
And I have the privilege of working with some community health workers in Delaware, and they serve as a, a bridge between communities, healthcare system, and state health departments. And like you said, I understand that you guys are um, hiring or planning to add a community health worker to the program who will assist you, Michelle. Um, where did that funding come from to help pay for the CHW? Uh, Lamars, I could I could speak to that. Um, we uh, are a partner with the National Health Corps. Uh, we uh, agree to take on um, one of their um, uh, participants in, in their program, uh, who will be working on uh, getting a certification as a community health worker. And uh, the National Health Card through AHEC, that's the, the local uh, organization working with the National Health Corps, uh, they were looking for partnering agencies that um, can work with one of their, uh, one of their partners uh, to do an internship uh, for 2,000 hours. Uh, they they need 2,000 hours to sit for, to take and to sit for a uh, certification. Um, so this, this person will be working with us over the next year um, and learning uh, all of the different components, but also serving in the role as a, a community health worker with us. But it's, it is actually through the National Health Corps, they are the ones who are funding the program. Great. Uh, thanks for that, that information. And also, uh, Norma, this question is for you uh, and also for Dr. Cruz. So now that the program has been in place for nearly six months and you have several months of positive data and feedback from the patients, and we're going to get into that um, uh, in a little bit as we move for further into this podcast, where do you envision taking the program from here? And I do have a chart that you provided to me, but can you explain this uh, and the processes that you plan on uh, for the future? Can, can, I, can I start this the, on this one? Um, where I envision the program going in the future is really to expand it. And obviously an RN is expensive to send an RN out the, or to do all these telehealth visits. So whether it's using a community health worker, a medical assistant, uh, uh, having some other people that can facilitate these visits. And, you know, it may be, hey, in this patient, I don't need a complicated exam. I need, I need someone to help get them internet and video and, you know, take a picture of their foot wound. And that would be something I would send, uh, you know, we could, we could have the community health worker facilitate that visit. And, oh, this is complicated patient. I really want the RN to go see them. So that would maybe a way to expand our services some, because I really think this is a very beneficial program for patients. And if I could add to that, Joe, uh, currently it's, you know, we have the, uh, the community health worker uh, really focusing on doing the telehealth at home program. Um, you know, it's those top three circles, the telehealth provider and the healthcare team, but we really would like to uh, get them more involved in uh, hooking patients up or, you know, putting those services around patients, uh, actually carrying through on, you know, a, a full referral. I talked uh, earlier about the food grant program, the food vouchers, uh, working with our, our partners over at, uh, at the hospital, um, you know, working with that piece. Um, also, you know, helping facilitate uh, with the uh, case management uh, for our ACO. We also are part of a chronic care management program, you know, getting them involved with, you know, identifying if there's needs there. Um, Michelle earlier talked about how she will get calls from, um, you know, our chronic care managers uh, to say that, you know, maybe this patient would benefit from a, ref uh, you know, for a telehealth visit. Um, and, and to go, you know, a little further into what Dr. Cruz just said, you know, there are functions that Michelle doesn't necessarily need to do as an RN. That this is something that a community health worker can get involved with, um, you know, identifying, you know, hooking patients up with, uh, you know, county van, uh, because transportation in the rural area here is, there's no buses, there's no taxis, you know, it's, you know, county van service, uh, you know, so that that's really important for patients. Uh, working with our out, out, 
reach in enrollment staff, uh, you know, trying to identify, you know, if patients are eligible for, for certain things. Um, and, you know, some, looking at some of those other circles on the, the spoke, those wheel here, uh, just, just making those other full connections and wrapping services around the patient and, you know, and taking these away from uh, Michelle's plate. Um, you know, she really can use help uh, with, you know, some of her day-to-day -day activities and it, it doesn't need to be an RN, it can be a community health worker. So, um, you know, that's where I envision uh, this program going for the future. Right, and, and just to, to add a note to that, uh, when you were talking about the transportation issues and knowing the, uh, the area where uh, your uh, practices are located very, very well, um, I, I know that this is a, you know, the, the travel and the scheduling for Michelle uh, is, is something that you're still looking at uh, trying to address and trying to, uh, to simplify. Uh, Michelle, you could probably talk to that a little bit. Um, you know, the different barriers, and, and this would be a barrier, um, you know, having to, to schedule your day so that you're, you're trying to uh, coordinate your schedule with with visits where they're grouped close together rather than going from one county to the next from, you know, having a 10 a.m. appointment in Pike County, but then having to go uh, all the way to northern Lackawanna County uh, for your next appointment and the travel time in between, uh, especially with the, the price of fuel right now, um, and trying to trying to streamline that process. Can you, um, you know, talk a little bit about how that has been a barrier? So initially we were having the offices, once it was piloted to the whole uh, nine offices, they were able to do their own scheduling. So they would put the patient's visit onto the provider and then they would put it also on, I have a separate schedule that they put it onto. As time has gone on, um, we have noticed that they don't look at the addresses so they don't understand the travel time between patients. So now I have requested that they just um, schedule it with the provider and then block it out on my schedule and send it to me. And then I will determine whether there's enough travel time between patients if needed. Um, and then if it doesn't work out, coordinating with the provider schedule and my schedule to get this patient seen as soon as possible. So we can decrease Great. the amount of travel time in between. Okay, and, and I'm sure that, that that has been, you know, a focus. I know that we talked about that earlier uh, during our planning sessions, uh, that this was one of the main barriers that you were looking to overcome uh, as you move forward with, with, with the program. Um, I mentioned earlier about the feedback along with the data uh, that you've collected so far. Uh, and Michelle, you were able to get a patient testimonial, uh, which explains about how well, the program has, um, you know, evolved from the inception. Uh, one of the patients that you were able to get a testimonial from uh, is a Teresa Blau, uh, who was a, a patient of Wayne Memorial Community Health Centers. And she reported that the telehealth program at Wayne Memorial Hospital is a fabulous program. I am unable to travel to the doctor at this time. So this program has kept me healthy and prevented me from going to the hospital. I am very prone to sepsis and cellulitis. Last year, I was in the hospital five times with various infections because I was unable to go to the office. Since my doctor has informed me of this program, it has changed my life. Dr. Mendez is fabulous, and my nurse Michelle is the best. She is so good at her job and always listens to my concerns. I feel very comfortable, and I know that I'm in good hands. I love this program. Testimonials like this are what you want to hear as a healthcare professional and the providers. Uh, this is what shows, aside from the data that you've collected, that this program is valuable and that it's very much needed in your communities. And so as we close out today's session, um, what additional components or activities um, are you considering that you'd like to see launched or included in the program in the future? And this is for, for the whole group. Well, you know, Joe, I think as the, you know, as we see uh, volumes increase with this program, um, you know, we know we will need to look at what our staffing needs are for the future, depending on volumes. We already talked about, uh, 
you know, sharing uh, the work with a community health worker. Um, but I, you know, I, I think we need to see uh, what what the patient's needs are. We know with the the COVID. Uh, potential resurgence in the fall um, that may bring, or, or again, you know, maybe uh, more vaccines, uh, more boosters, uh, you know, no one knows if what's going to happen with patients' desires to get um, booster vaccines right now for COVID. Um, right now, numbers are have dropped, but uh, initially, Michelle was making lots of visits out to homes uh, just to give COVID vaccines to patients um, because these are our patients who, who really, you know, who are really chronically ill and, and do need a, a booster vaccine. But again, it's that they can't get in, they have no one to take them. Um, so M Michelle was going out to the homes and um, this is a, a outside of a telehealth visit, uh, just doing COVID vaccines for patients. Um, so things like that. So, you know, that, that was unexpected that this would happen, but we, we had agreed and decided that, yes, this, this is something that she, you know, she can do um, in addition to, you know, the, the, an actual telehealth visit. So, um, I think as, as time goes by and, and you see what the needs are, uh, you, you know, you just try to uh, figure out how to accommodate uh, patients and, and, and try to help meet their needs. Fantastic. And, and that's the presentation of the information that you provided today is so valuable and it's, it's wonderful to see. Uh, a program like this, uh, you know, evolved from such a short period in, in such a short period of time, uh, and showing the success that it has. Uh, and I want to thank uh, all of you, uh, to Dr. James Cruz, uh, Norma Nasilla, and to you, Michelle Cook, for joining us today and sharing with everyone these great perspectives and the valuable, unique telehealth program that you've developed. We also want to thank you for your dedication um, to providing quality care to the patients that you serve in your community. And for those watching the podcast today, if you'd like to know more about this telehealth at home program or any of the other programs and services uh, that are provided by Wayne Memorial Community Health Centers, you can check out their website at www.wmh.org. Uh, all of the information will be available there. And in addition, um, just putting it up on my screen in front of me, uh, for those in attendance, we invite you to please share the link uh, to this podcast and the educational resources available to your staff and colleagues uh, at the website that you see on your link. It's also available directly in our resource library uh, on our website. And we thank everyone for participating and joining us today. And we will look forward to inviting you to uh, an upcoming presentation or podcast. So with that, so long, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you.